Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We're starting a, a new series where we're going to talk a little bit about, like, where did this Jesus guy come from? We talk about a genealogy or histories. Um, I know what you're thinking. That name is really clever, 23, and he, I came up with that, and my staff didn't stop me. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and I think we might be, like, in some trouble with using their graphics, so don't anybody tell anyone, Okay. Well, let us pray, and then we're going to jump into um, looking at Matthew and kind of why we're starting here in this place with the story of Ruth. So let's pray together. God, this morning as we gather, we simply ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts that are gathered here in this space would be acceptable to you because, God, you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, as we prepare to enter into this, this season we call Advent, this, this time where we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ uh, through the story of the Nativity, we, we want to sort of start at the beginning, which is the gospel according to Matthew, the genealogy. And, and I know how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but just know in your own heart, how many of you skip over genealogies when you're reading the Bible? I love that they're like, I want to confess. There's like entire, I remember when I went to seminary and I had to read all the names and I was like, I started reading in class and when I would read the names, I would say, and then that guy begat that guy who, I don't, his name starts with an A. I don't, like I couldn't read half the names and so it's really hard sometimes to read through them, but genealogies are included for a reason. And if you read them, with sort of an understanding of of why they're actually almost political in nature because who is included and who is not included is a very big deal and a little different. So if you have a a pew Bible in front of you, um, if you want to grab out, we're looking at Matthew, the first gospel. We're just going to look at Matthew 1 through 6. And I'm going to try not to butcher these names. This is the scary thing about having so many MDivs in one room. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram. Keep going with me, friends. And Aram the father of Aminadab. Now say that seven times the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Solomon, and Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, as we heard a moment, the father of King David. This is quite a list of people, a genealogy, and people have gotten really fascinated with their history. Has anyone in this room taken like the 23 in me and found out where they're from? Anyone done that or done ancestry.com, right? And, and sometimes you have surprises like you don't know, like, oh, that makes sense. Or, we, you know, we just did it recently uh, because we were really interested. My father is, uh, so my dad, his dad, and his dad are all we know of my dad's history. My great-grandfather, this is going to be very shocking, uh, my great-grandfather was an orphan. My last name is made up. So when people say, are you related to so-and-so Heath, I say, nope. My great-grandfather was John Heath because he was found on the Heathcliff. (laughs) He is uh, someone's last name. They just decided to call him John Heath. Made up last name which was great when we were in like sixth grade and everybody else had to make their family trees. Mine took no time. It was like, and we're done, which turns out in Mississippi, some other people's trees weren't as branchy as it should have been either. Um, Just kidding. 
See, when we, when we look at our history, when we look at our genealogy of, of where we come from, there is something really interesting. Some of us know our history is in, and we're proud of it. Some of us have some pain in our past. And I was recently uh, reading one author who said this, and I wanted to share with you because I think this is a great quote. This is Ralph Ellison, an African-American writer who is incredible and wrote this. Some people are your relatives, but others are your ancestors. And you choose the ones you want to have as ancestors. And you create yourself out of those values. For those of us who come from families that maybe weren't exactly what we were hoping they would be, what often happens is we we find mentors. People whose values, whose histories we were able to learn from and in that way create our own family. For some people, that has been church we become like our ancestors. So as we look at the story of Jesus and his ancestry is written, I want us to first notice that Ruth is mentioned. And and that should be a little odd for anyone who's a a Bible scholar because, well, A, that a woman is is mentioned as sort of the, the lineage, but not only that, it's Ruth, not Naomi. Ruth, who married into the family, not Naomi. It's a different sort of lineage. And, and, and what will become of Jesus, who Jesus will be, will be founded out of these sort of history of these people. And so knowing the stories of, of your ancestors, of your people, understanding how you integrate them into your own story. I was reminded of this when I was in seminary. I had heard all these stories about my, my grandma, and my grandma and my grandpa are, are from northern, they were from northern England, and so, um, you know, Evie and I were talking earlier about her, her dad didn't share many stories of World War I, and my grandpa didn't share many stories of World War II, because there was just this sort of stiff upper lip, don't always tell the stories, but every now and then, you would get a gem. One of the things that I loved about my family that no one ever really seemed to talk about was that my grandmother and my grandfather were both chemists. Now, chemists in England means that both my grandmother and my grandfather were pharmacists. But you see, my grandmother was a pharmacist before women really were pharmacists. And, and I didn't really realize the weight or the, the gravity of that until one time my grandfather actually told me a story because he went to a school with my grandmother, that's where they met, and he remembers that professors would try to lock the door so the women couldn't get in because he didn't believe that women should be pharmacists. Now, I know it's really shocking to think that in this, you know, now women are allowed to do everything, right? No. Um, right? That, that some people would believe that women couldn't do certain things. And, and this story sort of just sort of sat with me, that my grandmother would have been locked out of classrooms. And, you know, I remember my grandfather saying, but, you know, she was smarter than me. So she never had to be at the classes even. And that sat with me. And I remembered it when I was in seminary. And I wasn't in seminary that long ago. It's been a while, but not that long. Uh, I was walking in the hallway of this, and I was so excited to be in this new space. And I, I, I remember I was just reading a book and like walking, which is dangerous. And I overheard the conversation of the men in front of me as they waited to go into the class in which he said, I don't even know why there are women here. Hello? I'm like right behind you. I don't think women should be allowed to be in ministry. I mean, have they even read the Bible? And then I thought about my ancestry and my history. I come from a long line of women who don't behave well, who don't listen to those things. And so it wasn't surprising when when it was not even a thing of like, well, I'm going to go into class before him, and you better believe I walked in right in front of him. Now he doesn't have that same opinion today. But man, to be told you couldn't do something and to overcome it, that's part of my ancestry. So we get to this story of Ruth. And I want to say that we have really romanticized the story. In fact, so much so that we use it at weddings, right? Your God will be my God. And do, do you guys know the story of Ruth? I'm going to give you a little overview of it. Uh, Ruth is the book that comes after Judges, which is actually kind of important about where it is because Judges is just sort of this really, really, really harsh book. There is all kind of violence, particularly towards women. 
So that directly following this would be a, 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 just this one book that is about the story of women is incredible, and I don't want us to miss out on that. And it really begins as the story of Naomi. And Naomi and her husband, are, they are from the, Judah. They're, they're good. They're from Bethlehem, the best place to be, the area of bread, if you're wondering what Bethlehem means. They, they are, have two sons. Everything is going well. And then famine strikes. And Naomi's husband dies. And her sons uh, and her, they, they end up going, uh, they have to go outside of their own place. So they have to go to Moab, which is, you got to understand, it's like going to the worst area, the place everyone talks about those Moabites. We know this because in Deuteronomy, they weren't invited into the council. Those were kind of their cousins that they didn't love because they all were from the same lineage. But they didn't like the Moabites because the Moabites, get this, were descendants of Lot and incestuous relationships. Friends, everyone in the Bible are descendants of incestuous relationships. And yet they were able to other them to the point of, oh, the Moabites, those are the worst. Now, I can't imagine you guys picturing a time when we would other people to the point where we make all these claims about who they are and they couldn't be possibly like us, but just imagine what that would be like. It's really hard. Um, imagine, too, that it was to the point where in Israel they had two words. One word for those who were amongst us that were other. A word that would mean, like, if you were called this, it's a foreigner. But again, there's two words. You could be a czar. A czar was not the foreigner you wanted. They were the ones that brought disease, pestilence, those people. Or you could be a girl or an alien or a sojourner or one amongst you who could be just like you. And if you're wondering what that looks like, well, friends, I'm an immigrant, but most people don't want to talk about that. I am welcome. Others are not. And this was the experience. But all of a sudden, those who had had so much didn't anymore. There was famine, and so they had to go to those awful neighbors. And so they traveled together. Naomi, her family. And when they get there, um, what happens is that uh, the sons end up marrying Moabites, which is very shocking. One of them is Ruth and Opa. And what happens is that the sons die. And Ruth and Opa have to decide, because Naomi decides she's going to go back because she heard that now back in her homeland, they're going to be able to eat. And so she is traveling with them. And, and there's this great debate, and there's lots of great writing about why it is that one daughter-in-law leaves and the other one stays. And, and many of us know the, the speech that wonderful Ruth gives her mother-in-law. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. It's this beautiful moment. And it's not shocking to us because we just think Ruth is lovely and we quote her at weddings. But you have to understand, picture a, a people group that would make you uncomfortable. Don't say it aloud, by the way, nor look at anyone. Picture a people group that would make you uncomfortable and then to hear that they're the ones that are doing the most godlike thing, it was jarring to say the least. Ruth is the one who decides to stay with Naomi. Now, I don't want us to, to miss out or, or make this story all nice and fluffy because it is really awful in some ways, the culture and the time, that eventually what will happen is Ruth will marry Boaz, and in some ways, it's almost prostitution. Let's not just skip over that part of the Bible. But what is beautiful is that Boaz recognizes her personhood, buys the land, draws her into his people, and it's this beautiful story of then we have the lineage of David, who then, giving this away, guys, later, is how Jesus gets here. So in Jesus' background is the story of someone who was completely othered. Now, some people have this opinion that Naomi wanted her people, wanted her daughters to leave because she didn't want them to go through what it was like for her to be a foreigner in a foreign land. And maybe that is true. And so sometimes we all say, oh, Ruth was the good one, and oh, but she's the bad one because she left, but, but she really was going back to her people and her responsibilities. But what I want us to notice about Ruth is that Ruth engages in this thing we've been talking about, where she doesn't have orthodoxy, does she? 
She doesn't know the right things about God. She has no idea. She's prayed no prayer. She has no idea like who God is, but she says, your God will be my God. And then she acts on that and has orthopraxy or correct action. The outsider is the one who is teaching the rest about what it means to be clung to something, to be promising of something, to be present to someone that is in deep pain. I think if we look at this history, this this story of Ruth, there's so much for us to know and to understand where does God come from? If we talk about this idea of Jesus having this lineage, why is it that we're told that Ruth is in this family? Because it should be scandalous. Because I think it's a hint for us that Jesus' message will always be understood by those on the margins a little bit better. And then it won't come from great orthodoxy, but it will come from orthopraxy. Boaz will call his future wife a worthy woman, a worthy woman. Again, if you just read over and glaze over it, it shouldn't be shocking. But if you look at who gets called a worthy woman, it's always those who knew how to trust Yahweh. And it's always those who had high prestige. To call her that is to saying within Israel, this woman is one of prestige. That's not usual. I want us to get some lessons from Ruth. That sometimes faith looks like having the right action and maybe not yet the right belief. That sometimes we get so stuck on, do they think the way I think? When really it's this beautiful thing where in Jesus' history it was about, do they act in a way that is godly or filled with Yahweh? I also want us to notice, too, that that neither Ruth nor Naomi deny their grief. Henri Nouwen, one of my favorite writers, says, the dance of life finds its way beginning in grief. Here, a completely new way of living is revealed. It is the way in which pain can be embraced, not out of a desire to suffer, but in the knowledge that something new will be born out of this pain. Ruth's story is one of great pain, and yet there is hope born out of it. Oftentimes, it's our greatest suffering that will cause us our greatest ability to help those around us. We've talked about that a lot, the the wounded healer. Suffering just to suffer, it's really not the way of God. There is something being born out of it, this midwifery, this childbirth. And, and I think for those of us in this room, we've, some of us have experienced this, haven't us? We've experienced having to leave our old way of life, coming into something new. There's been something revealed to us, and we can't stay in the place we were. And it can be so disruptive, but on the other side is beauty and a new understanding of God. And God can do amazing things as we come out of that suffering. Jesus has this in his history, which will make sense because Jesus' life here on earth was not easy. He was a foreigner. You know, I, I, I shared a couple of weeks ago a story that I think is really funny that we often miss, which is when Jesus preached at his hometown, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Like, that's not easy. So if he's going to learn about what it means to be someone who is tenacious, he's going to have to come from a line of people who have taught us that. The book of Ruth, it's almost this little sleeping, sort of like hidden message, and I love it because most of the Old Testament understandings of who God is, we get from like a a bush talking, which is bizarre, or some sort of like natural thing that happens. It's like really crazy and it's this huge thing. And then we get to the story of Ruth where we learn about God simply from something small, from a community, from the interactions of two people. And more scandalous than anything, it's two women. Two women who, who bond together to form community, who had no other sense of belonging. Some times. Belonging is our way into believing. That's a really, let me say that again. Sometimes belonging is our way into believing. Maybe you've experienced that in this room before. 
Maybe you weren't really sure who this God, uh, like all these ideas about God, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, we always, this is a very American way, by the way, I don't know how I feel about it, but we're always sort of like, how, who is God, what is God? And yet, when we come together to, to do something in the community together, that feels like God. When I go to my community group and, and I'm there and I'm present and I'm sharing, that feels like God. And so those moments of of engaging and belonging are the moments that highlight believing. Ruth knows who God is because Ruth acted in a godly way. Jesus will walk around sort of reminding people that those on the margins are really who he came from because he comes from the margins. He was not considered to have a fancy genealogy. Yeah, sure, David's in there, but... Guys, as we've talked about, David was not a great guy. Beloved king, sure, not a great guy. As we talk about Ruth, the word that is often is hest, this Hebrew word which means overflowing love. Not ordinary love, it's, it's, but it's also every day. It's this weird sort of commitment. David's story is is one of like grandeur, but Ruth's story is one of commitment. What does that look like for us? What does it mean to have a lineage of our, our, our Savior, our Messiah, has this lineage where it was so important that somebody be committed to something? I was at a, a retreat the last three days and, and one of the guys mentioned the idea of religion and everyone in the room, like, we feel so cool. So we're like, we're spiritual, not religious, which by the way, doesn't mean much. But um, everyone was like, oh. And the guy said, no, 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 religion. The word religion isn't bad because the word religion simply means to be bound to something, to be committed to something. And I think we have been um, so afraid of being committed to something. I, I joke often that like millennials don't even want to belong to Costco. It seems like too much of a commitment, right? Like I'm like, like every year when I pay it, I'm like, am I going to use it? You know, like there's all this sort of stuff, but we, we are formed by what we, what we are committed to. So even when we're not sure what we believe, if we enact in the ways that give us belonging, and we miss out on that sometimes because we, we skip over these stories that are difficult and hard. And so I don't want us in the next couple of weeks as we talk about this genealogy, I want us to see sort of these like moments of resistance that we're given where, where Jesus' own genealogy is going to teach us about who the Messiah is. The Messiah for us, the marginalized, the one who knew what it meant to be an immigrant, those left out. Sometimes I don't like this book. Like, I wish I could take parts of it out, which is a huge heresy, by the way. But, but there are parts of it that, like, I just, like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with the fact that one of our, one of our historical references is about, like, one of our heroes. She basically was, like, thrown in, like, you have to go marry this guy and you'll be the savior of everything. But, but then I realized these stories, when we reclaim them, we look at them upon with new eyes, the familiar becomes unfamiliar, we can get so much out of it. Ruth is indeed a hero. If you are interested in our children's ministry, and all of you should be, We've been having these amazing meetings and conversations lately, and we need lots more volunteers, so please come to our meeting at 1115. Um, we've been having all these meetings about, like, do we use the Bible? And you're like, of course you use the Bible. But, but really, like, do we use the Bible? And, and I came and I said to them, guys, I really want us to use the Bible, not for maybe the reason you think, but I think if we aren't teaching folks how to read the Bible in a way that tells the story of the marginalized, then then we're told how to read this. And it's in ways where the powerful continue to win. And it's in ways that this becomes a weapon. So we're going to start using the Bible, but highlighting some of the stories that, that maybe teach us about our genealogy, teach us about our history, teach us about who Jesus is and was. And I'm so, I love, by the way, I love our team that do children's ministry stuff because they're like doing such great work around like, how do we make this something that wasn't weaponized like it was weaponized for us when we were younger? How can this be a story not just about like obedience and why God will smite you if you do the wrong thing? But how can this be a story about resistance and what it means to have this, you know, just ability to say, no matter what, I'm gonna be present with God? 
That's the beauty of the stories in here. And and sometimes I I don't always want to use every little piece of it, but I have to remember this is in general a larger story, one that we're all a part of where, where God is pursuing God's people and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't, but it's not about us, it's about God. And because of that, they're beautiful stories. Friends, I hope you will join us for the next two. I'm so excited. So today we talked about Ruth, right? A little bit of a scandalous story. We're ending with Rahab. Get ready. Um, We're also going to talk about Josiah, who some of you may not know. And we're going to have a lot of fun just looking at these different stories and why they're included in the genealogy. Because if we're going to get excited about Jesus coming, we want to know where he came from. Am I right? Let us pray. God, as we prepare ourselves to learn not just more about you, but more about who we are because of you, we ask that you would be present in in our learning. God, I ask that this week as we go out into our own families, our own communities, you would remind us of the ancestors, those who went before, those who teach us by the way that they lived out their faith. May we be reminded that it's about how we live out our faith, not necessarily all the different beliefs, but how you are present. God, may we look to the margins, the places where you are. Lord, it's in your amazing name that we pray. Amen.